slide. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this, the first public meeting of the Policing Board following the reconstitution after our recent May elections to the Assembly. Particularly welcome uh, are our new political members who joined the board, Nola McAllister and Sinead McLaughlin. Chief Constable, we have your accountability report, and as a board, uh, we spent a constructive day yesterday uh, with your leadership team discussing priorities and issues for the time ahead. Uh, I think it was very beneficial and session which we will certainly repeat again in the near future. It's fair to say the budgetary position featured uh, heavily and perhaps more so now given new emerging pressures uh, in terms of fuel, utility costs and the, the indeed likely wider societal impacts or policing uh, from the cost of living crisis that everyone of us now faces. Uh, we too have to make a series of representations to the Minister on your behalf around the budget and will continue to advocate for an improved financial settlement for policing. Um, in the meantime, we must work within the draft budget allocated, making sure that we have it used to best effect. And I know that you and your team are looking very carefully at how that can uh, be carried through. This week, it was uh, uh, fortunate that no officers were injured when responding to an incident in uh, London Derry. There were also other incidents over the last number of weeks when officers were responding to calls for help. It's shocking that there were 1,541 assaults on police officers in the last financial year and 909 of which resulted in injury with some of those life changing. And as a board, we do condemn all such attacks on your officers. Uh, I, along with other board members and colleagues, attended the launch of the Here For You Police Services uh, Public Engagement Vision and eight new hallmarks of neighbourhood uh, policing. Uh, as you know, the board is fully supportive of continued investment in local neighbourhood policing teams and the importance of listening to and engaging with the community in improving the service uh, delivery. Um, these hallmarks reinforce the commitment of the police to continue uh, to improve the service delivered and we will be monitoring progress against each uh, going forward and looking forward to hearing positive outcomes that come from that. Um, one of the hallmarks relates to embedding the right culture and that culture applies right across the police service. Uh, we have had a series of recent discussions with you and your leadership team on professional standards, ethics and culture with assurances sought that the policies and procedures in place are robust in dealing with inappropriate behaviours and actions. And indeed, unfortunately, again, in the news today, uh, we have uh, seen yet more uh, inappropriate behaviours that are reported upon and there will be questions around those later on. Uh, we very much welcomed your statement to the organisation that there will be zero tolerance of sexual misconduct, domestic abuse, harassment, bullying and discriminatory or other inappropriate behaviours and that any such conduct should be both challenged and reported and we support you fully in that. The board has agreed to bring extra scrutiny and focus to this area in the time ahead and we've already had discussions on this through our performance committee. So having said that, hand over to you, Chief Constable, for your uh, introductory remarks. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chair. And um, yes, uh, good afternoon to uh, members, old and, and new. Um, just, uh, I'll keep my comments relatively brief, Chair, um, but probably will flip between the report presented today and also the annual report, which will be released uh, this afternoon as well, which presents a number of highlights. Um, just to sort of, Begin with the sidebar issue. Clearly, the, the matter of assaults is, is one of concern. I think the figures you may see later will see that they've gone up uh, over the last year by nearly a third. So we sort of echo your comments. And I know there's a lot of work done behind the scenes to both support officers that sadly are injured, but also to make sure they have the appropriate training and equipment to reduce the risk of injury in their job that they do on our behalf around the clock. So to pay tribute and thanks to them. But at the same time, sadly, we sit here this afternoon uh, sort of absolutely shocked by some of the harrowing news today in terms of the behaviour of officers in another setting. Now, obviously, you'll appreciate I have to be personally careful for a whole raft of reasons about not referring to a specific case, uh, but it's to reassure the board and indeed the wider community that um, the prospect that a public servant in whom we trust could even think about defiling somebody 
after they have died is both harrowing, shocking, and it just besmirches the reputation of this service, which people have invested so much in and continue to do so. So I would condemn that. There is no way myself or the senior team could ever consciously say this is something that reflects the values and standards of people that work on all of our behalf to protect them around the clock. Clearly, um, we will probably deal with difficult questions in relation to that today. Um, if you look at the issue that's triggered the inquiry, uh, that was five years ago. Uh, the world, as ever, is changing rapidly. So in terms of individual offers of behaviour, aside from the evolution of training, the reinforcement of standards that you, you've referred to, Chair, um, there are other checks and balances that increasingly we rely on to both sometimes support officers in difficult encounters they have, but also to make sure that the standards we expect are upheld, and specifically greater use of body one video uh, in crime scenes and indeed in encounters with the public, I think is something we want to continue to see to evolve. Uh, clearly as well, we're not in this endeavour alone. Uh, we have an active and constructive dialogue with the police ombudsman to make sure that she has confidence in our procedures, but we also cooperate with investigations. And then at times, of course, the role of the public prosecution service is there to bring we would like to see Swiss revolution to some of these cases. But I'm sure that we, we can say that later. I think for completeness, uh, you remember in March that Pamela and Mark and I issued the statement of conduct and standards. And to just directly lift from that, to remind people, we have said unequivocally there is no tolerance for behaviour that is misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic, racist, sectarian, or discriminatory towards any person with disability. And this includes the use of social media or messaging platforms to spread that type of inappropriate behaviour. So we will keep reinforcing our expectation about the, the quite right and proper standards of people that should be able to wear a uniform with pride in terms of what the service represents in its values and standards. Uh, turning to the wider report, Chair, clearly today we uh, have a chance to reflect on the fact that we still, despite today's pretty grim and harrowing headlines, good news, uh, we remain one of the safest parts of the UK, and I refer to that in the report. Um, page 49 of the annual report also reminds us that in the last two years, we have made more arrests by the Power of Military Crime Task Force than we have in the preceding four. And I know that's an issue of constant concern. That are we doing enough to support wider departmental and government work to sort of call out and address and try and undermine paramilitary activity? Um, last week, you referred to it, and uh, credit to Bobby Singleton and his team who's here today, and a whole host of people behind the scenes. I think last week's event at Mosley Mill with Here For You and the Hallmarks was a really, really professionally run but celebrate your event, not just in terms of ambition, but our commitment to do what we can to both reinforce neighbourhood policing, bring it into the fore of what we are delivering, as well as what we say we care about. And you quite rightly say that the first standard there is actually embedding the right culture, and I'm sure we'll keep coming back to that. Um, in terms of the report itself, it also highlights the continuing difficulties with the budgetary situation. Pamela and others are working hard to remedy that. Um, but also we pay tribute to officers, despite some of the difficult headlines we've got this morning that were reflected by honours in the birthday uh, award uh, honours system. So at times when we have to look deeply into our soul about what has gone wrong, it's about recognising as well where people step forward to do things really well on our behalf. But given uh, wider issues at play today, I think I'll confine my comments for the moment and just take questions from the board. OK, thank you, uh, Chief Constable. Um, we recognise some of the issues as to what you can say around uh, judicial procedures and other things in regard to this case, but you will recognise that we must start there. And so I'm going to ask the first question from Jerry Kelly. Thank you, Chair. And uh, the Chief Constable has mentioned uh, about the news report that was on this morning. It was difficult uh, listening, I think, for anybody and uh, very distressing for the family uh, who, were on, who were on this morning. As, as I understand it, and it's unfortunate we're hearing it on the news first, but a young man uh, took his own life. The family were actually put out of the room where his body was lying, and then photographs were taken. As I think you may have mentioned yourself, there's a uh, defiling of the body. And I suppose some of the questions I'll come to later is, is what powers they have in terms of, of all of that. It was shared on WhatsApp, and this is not the first time. 
W5 police officers. We are using uh, WhatsApp for uh, this type of uh, inappropriate activity. There were sectarian comments put on it in a small loop. So they not only did they take the photographs, they then adapted the photographs to make it uh, even more uh, insulting, if I could put it that way. And unfortunately, there's, there's, there is, uh, this thing has been going on for years. That is the, whatever investigation is involved, but I understand one uh, police officer was uh, suspended and with full pay. And um, I, I just wanted to sort of then put that into questions to yourself. And I've heard what you said about, you know, there is an investigation. You, you have to be careful, but by the same token, this is in the public in the public interest because what happens here will affect uh, the entire uh, police service. So uh, I suppose the questions are: What have the police done or are going to do now if they can't talk about this incident? Then, as examples of incidents like this, and uh, what can they do to prevent the, the disgraceful and I would say corrupt action? Uh, why has it taken so long? You know, um, to go through this, to get it to the family, the family didn't know about it for a considerable period of time, to get that information to the family. And just why is it suspended on full pay when early evidence, and I understand people's rights in this, but when early evidence is that you have a photograph, if you have a photograph uh, which doesn't tell a lie, you know the owner of the photograph, you know what's happened there. So while there might be other issues to do with, with any case, why is there not an ability to take action which people can see straight away as the police taking action uh, on an incident, whatever happens in, after that? And uh, the worry is this is not the first time, as I said earlier, uh, is this another WhatsApp group um, which would be even more uh, devastating. Uh, and can a, police, can a police member be on his or her own if they're, if, if they're in the scene? Because one of the other questions that are in my head is, why did somebody else not say what was happening? Why did they not bring it to you or to whoever was the appropriate authority? And that's that's the questions if I could encapsulate them in that, please. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, th there is a few bits that I'll try and unpick and probably bring Mark in as well, if I can, Chair, because uh, there, there are things we're doing to try and address this, but I'll pick a few up. I think the first thing to state is uh, talking in general terms because I have to be careful. It doesn't sort of prohibit me from extending my sympathies. I, I just cannot imagine how hurrying this might be um, to, to the family and, and our apologies, notwithstanding the broader issues that are going on at the moment, which would inhibit some of what I can personally say. Um, I think, it, again, I, I refer to it in the statement of action, Jerry, which uh, you and colleagues have seen, but there is no place, not just for behaviour like this, but for the added insult, if you like, of sectarian comments, which sort of almost make your stomach churn if the issues in terms weren't, weren't bad enough. Um, the other thing, we talked about new technology we are introducing to equip officers with more versatility, both on the uh, mobile to phone type devices they have and the rubberized laptops. Um, Mark's been doing a lot of work with this with um, ICS colleagues. It is our aspiration soon uh, we can come back with a specific date when we're confident the technology is stable um, to actually introduce our own direct messaging and group messaging service. One of the reasons that WhatsApp is there, apart from it being sort of established mo uh, social media sort of platform, is because of the vagaries of technology, people do rely on it for rostering and, and sort of finding groups of people because um, we haven't had an alternative technology up to now, but our intention effectively is to introduce a police version that has the same <laughs> versatility and then we will seek to prohibit use of WhatsApp whilst at work so that it doesn't necessarily get rid of some of the attitudes and behaviour which is the broad issue about culture uh, but it will certainly limit future use of a platform like this to, sh to both take and share images and attitudes which are vile and abhorrent. Um, the issue about single people being in a scene, you can't always say no, because obviously depending on a scene, people will move around a house, um, so on and so forth. Um, the issue you raise about suspension, um, I think sometimes people feel it's incredulous that we don't act more quickly, um, but suspension is a, is a neutral act in employment terms, and we do have to abide by employment law, because at times uh, when we don't, 
uh, people or perceived not to, people also then seek legal remedies. So we're sometimes caught in a rock and a hard place in trying to, to get that right. Um, there are broader questions about, I think, not just what has happened in the past, this, the event that would trigger the conversation today, as I say, Jerry, began five years ago. I think it's also about your confidence in us to root out this behaviour and set the right standards in the here and now. Um, we, you will see at the moment, and I think we've touched on this a number of times, about the number of officers under investigation. Uh, it's fair to say actually the bulk are referred by other officers, so we obviously get some complaints from the public, but Mark will probably come in and with a bit more specifics. And equally, at the moment, and we probably have a benchmark with one of the UK's most senior experienced conduct barristers about he's seeing how robust and consistent our approach is actually to, to dealing with, and he pays tribute to our appropriate authority, who's the individual decision maker in the here and now that makes some of the decisions about what's acceptable and what's not. So it's not we're being complacent and asleep at the wheel while some of these issues come into the public domain. You'll know we talked about in the past as well, the work we want to do to better understand a whole range of issues around culture and the cultural audit is in commissioning phase at the moment and will be sort of in the organisation uh, within a few weeks and then obviously the bigger question is well what does that tell us and then what do we need to do next but if I can Chell just bring Mark in to bring a, a few more specifics to, because I imagine there'll be other members sort of aghast about what's going on uh, in terms of what we're doing in terms of raising professional standards and, and actually sort of exploring are we using all the tools and legislation that would at our disposal. Yeah, thanks, Chief. And I just would want to lend my weight to the, to the comments of the Chief Constable about, about these allegations. And uh, I, can't, I can only imagine uh, how the family feel, but also in the broader community, about what this, people, what this says about our police officers. And, you know, I think sometimes it's easy to say, well, this is just one or two people. And generally it is, but I think we can't say that anymore because these issues of one officer alleged issues I appreciate the minute but they, they ripple across the entire the police service and uh, right up to to my office and the chief's office and um, you know there's there's not one of us uh, at all who wouldn't just wholeheartedly condemn this but it, it also then says to the public well why is this happening these allegations and what sort of service do we have now I know the people I work with um, I also know that in the role I have in misconduct that I deal with the worst elements of of some people who have a sworn office um, and I know it doesn't represent the entire of the organization but there are there is behavior that needs to be robustly addressed um, we need to let the ombudsman investigation get carried through the detail in the public arena has is obviously owned by the police ombudsman they are the ones who have unearthed most of this detail uh, the police service was involved in this at the very beginning and then the uh, the, uh, the matter was then passed to police ombudsman just to clarify as well, and we were asked about an officer, an officer has been suspended, but a second officer was also suspended related to this as well. So there are two related at the time as well. The issue of delay and so forth, again, the Ombudsman has addressed some of that. That's not exclusive to the Ombudsman. Uh, there's issues of delay in investigations that we lead on, and there's also issues of delay in waiting for um, determinations from the PPS and then the court system. So. It's not exclusive just to uh, police cases. Um, these happen in, in, in cases of civilian life as well, but it does add to the, the, the concerns of the public and accept that, um, very, very acute accept that. Now, my, it's my job to review suspensions every month um, to make sure they're still appropriate um, and that the, the case is still met for them, uh, which we do. And most of the reasons each month that we, we extend is because the case is still under investigation or is still awaiting determination, or is still under consideration by the PPS, or we're awaiting uh, a trial, or we're awaiting uh, a misconduct hearing. Uh, and these things are lengthy. We see misconduct hearings running on for long periods. They are heavily challenged. They are quasi-judicial in their, in their, in their process, uh, with, pre with management hearings and cases that can last four or five days just to take the evidence. The main learning point in the last year uh, that uh, uh, professional standards and myself have tried to develop is, is the use of the 2016 regulation special case hearing processes to try and expedite matters. So what we are doing this year and have done quite successfully is where there is no prejudice to a criminal case, we have expedited a number of misconduct matters um, and moved them, moved them through the system more quickly. Um, 
So we probably haven't been as good as that in the past, but that does rely upon there being no prejudice with the, with the, criminal, with the criminal process. There are also um, interplays between ombudsman investigations and police investigations, and, and their investigations are quite rightly and completely independent of us, a ring fence from us. They share some information where they can, but we're not party to all elements of their investigations at any particular time. Uh, and there's appropriate reasons for that uh, in terms of independent investigation. But I don't think that the Ombudsman or ourselves, the Chief Constable, would be adverse to continuing to understand how we can speed the processes up um, and, uh, and how we can you know, work even better to drive out behaviour. Um, we have dismissed more people in the first half of this year than we did in the entirety of last year. We have 13 panels, uh, which, of which people can be dismissed, although they have a range of sanctions uh, planned. We have a number of special case hearings planned. Um, we have over, we've almost 130 uh, cases of gross misconduct that we're investigating. Uh, and we're also being criticised as well for being too robust, as well as not being quick enough. It's a very difficult area, uh, although one that we have to accept criticism in and also accept learning in. Um, the new head of professional standards um, is looking particularly at the performance of the unit, um, uh, has set up a, um, a, a process which you're going to look at for continuous, professional, continuous continuous improvement, which is going to look at process times, performance, uh, relationships, uh, remit, and even just, just the, the interplay uh, between the department and what it does and other elements of investigation across the organisation. Um, because there are different ways that things come into professional standards and there are different places where things are investigated as well. So we, we welcome that. Um, and, you know, we have to say that as horrific as this stuff is, it's better that it's addressed. It's better that uh, we're held to account for it. It's better that things change. And it's better that, you know, that we shine a light where, where it needs to be shown into the, the worst types of, of human behaviour if they're proven. And, um, as difficult as that it is, we just have to get on with it. Uh, we've seen a clues on this, but the issue of police conduct really since the murder of George Floyd in the USA has been written large across the globe and, uh, and it will continue to be until I think the public are satisfied and we're satisfied that um, these matters are being dealt with. I know there's other members want them, so, so very briefly to turn to. I want to turn to this suspension. You see, uh, I mean, I know certainly in, in outside of public service that there's uh, people would be suspended. If if there is, because people have rights, so there's times you will you'll suspend with pay. But if there's if there's evidence, let's not talk about this case. If there's if there's incontrovertible evidence, like a photograph, like a video, right? the ownership of the evidence. I don't understand then, or, or tell me, does, when people are suspended, do they have to be suspended on full pay? Or is it, can you make a decision which is, you know, this, this, is, this is unacceptable? Because the public, it is a public service, and the public are watching what, what the leadership of the PS now do. Um, Mike, Jerry, please. Sorry. <coughs> No, it's, a, it's really pertinent. Um, under regulation, um, it's set on the Police Act, no, the conduct regulations don't allow for suspension without pay. So um, those decisions are made by me. Um, and if, if, if gross misconduct has been assessed by the, by the appropriate authority, and this is very highly regulated, uh, then I have to make a consideration that allows sort of one of three things. One is to leave the officer in the post that they are currently carrying out. Um, quite often to do that, would, would we, we would argue, would undermine public confidence and also might allow a furtherance of behaviour, but also might expose the officer to more allegations as well. So the next consideration then is uh, suspension or reposition, and reposition is as an alternative to suspension. And, uh, and certainly, you know, in looking at suspension, we look at the seriousness of the offence and then we have to consider whether or not repositioning is appropriate. So repositioning would normally mean that we place an officer still at work 
um, but in, in, a, in a place where we feel that we that there's, there is no chance that they could interfere with witnesses, either the internal witnesses or external. They could access police systems around their case, or they could carry out a furtherance of the behaviour for which they have, um, for which they're under investigation. If we're satisfied that those things can be managed, then they will, they may well be repositioned. Um, if they're not, if 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 they are not satisfied, if I'm not satisfied with being managed, then it, I then move to what the public interest test is. It the public interest to remove this person from the office of constable? Suspension removes from you the office of constable. It removes from you the powers of constable. It removes from you the access to the police station. You are suspended from the office, but you are still an employee of the chief constable. You are still bound by the code of ethics and still paid as an employee, um, and, and that's. That's the regulations that we have to work with them, um, and that's as, as sort of as factual as it can be with it, Chair. Okay, thank you. There are a series of others who wish to come in here on the same subject, so we'll crack on. And Linda Dillon first, please, Linda. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the answers so far. Can I just get some information about around what reassurance the PSNA can give to the loved ones, to anyone who loses a loved one? In any circumstances, whether that be natural death or in tragic circumstances, that the remains of their loved ones will not only be treated professionally, but also with humanity, with dignity, the way in which any one of us would want the remains of our loved ones, of our child, of our mother, brother, sister, to be treated. Because for me, the real but of this is that somebody put their hands on the remains of somebody else's child without any need to do so. And I think that, that that's really what we need to look at here. What reassurance can we be given that this will never happen? That if somebody loses their loved one tomorrow, they can feel confident that the PSNA officers who attend that scene will treat the remains of their loved ones with the humanity with which they deserve. Well, I, I, absolutely, Linda. I think both Mark and I have sort of echoed both sympathies for the family. Many of us are, are, are parents ourselves, so that any death is tragic. But in those circumstances, there's, there's sort of an added sort of um, effect to it. And I think the words you ch choose are really appropriate. There's an expectation that not only in difficult circumstances, when you're dealing with all forms of people that have sadly passed away, we act professionally, but we also treat people's remains with dignity. Um, and also the notion that anyone would seek to defile those remains is just inconceivable. So you certainly have my commitment, and I'm sure Mark's and Pamela's and the senior team, that the unequivocal message is this is just not behaviour that we would tolerate. Uh, and if we have to restate internally or in other places, this does not represent any notion of behaviour of a public servant. And not only that, but a public servant with high expectations, a lot of trust and powers that you think behaviour in general terms like this is by any way acceptable. And I think, you know, we are determined to ask the hard questions. You will judge yourselves, both what we've been doing in the last 12 months or so, but also what we're committing to do in the next 12 and 18 months, that this is a key issue to get right. Um, it, it is an issue of, uh, in one sense, as Mark said, individual behaviour, but also in the general sense that I've said since day one, leaders set the tone. Um, and that applies to me, it applies to Mark and the team here, but also the people that help us police the country around the clock in all sorts of different ways. So we will continue to reinforce about doing the right thing, about professionalism, about pride in what we do. And no one, no one wants to see the sort of headlines we see this morning with all the consequences in the days ahead about trust in our organisation. So we will probably bring back more information when the board next sits. Uh, if you like to share about where we see things are by the autumn. I know there's some conversation about a special theme day about professional standards. I think we'd welcome that so that we can, if you like, explain some of the different practices and processes that we work around in terms of setting values, setting expectations, reinforcing them through to the investigation uh, in various forms that Mark has touched upon when things either go wrong in real time or we have matters of corruption highlighted to us because we have to look at the whole panoply of behaviour to give people confidence that public servants are discharged in their duty in the ways that we want. Your mic, please. Sam. So just in relation to that then, what, what assurance, what, what can a family ask for if their loved one 
remains or, or in the home because the one thing that stood out to me from that father speaking this morning was that he was asked to leave the room and he left and forever in a day he will have the question in his head if I had not have left that room. So what rights do a family have to say I want to remain in the room with the remains until the undertaker or the person of my choosing who will deal with the remains of my loved one is in attendance? I think again we've got to be careful I don't drift into specifics because we, we don't want that, that not to um, undermine any wider process and we have to remember sometimes that we will come in contact with people's remains in different circumstances so I think there's one route where actually a family member might be a suspect because you know there's different types of situations but in a, in a case where we're dealing with somebody that you know has apparently died in for, by other circumstances. I think there's absolute expectation that we are professionally and with dignity. But our training would even show that you know, we have to go with an open mind and into any scene where we find somebody has died. Uh, and because learning would say that what you see initially isn't always uh, what might happen in due course. For example, you may turn a body over that looks quite quiet and peaceful and then find an injury that might take you somewhere else. So the training will be about making sure that scene is preserved because if it is a crime scene you don't want that crime scene disrupted by too many people coming and going. So but I think it's about the reassurance that you need and the wider public is that even in doing that and there's a range of professionals that will be involved in that sort of circumstance we are determined to assure people we will act professionally and also with dignity understanding the upset and hurt that people have any time a close family member dies. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we continue again with questions on this theme. Uh, Trevor, next. Thank you, Chairman. I, I want to be careful and appreciate what has been said thus far. Um, but I want to pick up something Mark said around, not the specific case, but the general, generality of all of this. <clears throat> I suppose this is at least the second occasion that something like this has come to the board on the back of a, a TV programme. But I think Mark's words were, better we were held to account. Now, would you accept, Chief, that we're you're, we're, we're prevented from holding you to account because then we don't know how many people in relation to other cases are suspended, the length of those cases, the nature of those cases, and the length of the process of each of those cases. And on the back of today's story, would it be possible that we actually have a briefing to outline all of those cases, the nature of them, the length of them? And I said, the most important thing for me is because. Quite often we, we, we focus on different committees here. It's important also we, we, we focus on the rank of each of those officers as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just come to that I, I, Mark wants to come in, but I, I mean, I think certainly in, in, in general terms, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see the notion of this is about transparency. We're not, not trying to sit behind grim headlines or even the totality of what we're dealing with. And Mark gave some sense before of the, the effort we've put into sort of calling out bad behaviour and then trying to address it as expeditiously as we can. But there are also some issues around your role in conduct eventually, which we've got to take into account. I don't know where Mark was going to go. But, no, um, but. No, I was just to say, Trevor, you know, when, when we briefed the, the performance committee in March, we did outline the numbers who were suspended and who, you know, the length of times. But I appreciate, and we only give very, we give headline detail across a number of, of, case, of reasons why people were suspended. Um, so um, we can have those those conversations. There, there's no problem with that. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm happy to try and provide as much detail as I can to the board um, without us all um, bumping into some of our statutory responsibilities. But that's, I'd be very keen to do that if it helps promote confidence. Okay, I, I mean, I've, we, in the earlier session, the private session, have agreed that we will have a session over the, the, the summer months to look at what's coming through uh, and the issues that sit around that. And I know John has raised this, and John is next on my list to come in. So uh, over to you, John Blair. Yeah, sure. Thank you. It follows on directly from what Trevor raised there, but I, I hope to put a clear definition on what we need to do. It is a, a worrying trend that we, we are discussing this uh, misconduct and alleged misconduct on what seems to be an increasingly regular basis and we need to deal with this trend um, and seem to be dealing with it as effectively as possible to seek better outcomes and not try to get there on an ad hoc meeting basis. So can I ask in that regard if the Chief Constable can commit the Police Senior Executive Team mm -hmm. to participate in a meeting of this board dedicated 
to issues around misconduct processes, whistleblowing, and the time frames around all of these, as well as the role and resource, for that matter, of professional standards department in the process as well. Mike, Thank you. thanks, John. Yeah, more than happy to do that, John, because I think the issue clearly is concerning today, but it is not the first time it has been a matter that we've considered in the last 12 months. So I think understanding, as I said earlier, the various routes and avenues and what we're doing is important. Um, I think it's also about setting context because it's something that probably is the single issue that Mark and I spend most time discussing um, at the moment. And we have engaged advice from uh, one of the UK's most senior, the most senior police conduct uh, prof professional in, in, in a, a barrister sense. His advice to us really is that because of the actions we have been taking, if you look at the data, we are going into a bell curve of high number of cases, uh, more likely number of suspensions, and more cases therefore on the system as we address underlying attitudes and behaviours. So his expectation, and probably to shape yours, is that this may continue for a while until people get the message that a range of things aren't part of a modern police service, a progressive police service, or an inclusive service. So I think more than happy to share that that information and participate in that day because I think it's important to give you the assurance that our systems and processes are robust, how we set our values and expectations are all that you would like to see, and that also where we can, we're bringing swift resolution to those cases. Mindful, as we've said a few times, we're also affected particularly by the decisions of the Ombudsman and also the advice from the Public Prosecution Service. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike? Did you have a, a, your question on this, or do you want to go into the other? No, let me just check in with Michael whether you wish to ask us a further question, Michael, or whether you've had the answers that you wanted. I, I do want to ask, ask a specific point. I'm conscious, Chief Constable, but you know, you've plenty of good work going, out, going on out there, and we're, we're sort of getting into quite a narrow territory here. But uh, I do feel compelled to return just to the issue of the recent Spotlight programme, the disclosures linked to PSNI Coleraine, uh, and the concern, really the significant concern within the wider public. And I appreciate while the events may still be under investigation, the WhatsApp group revelations were of particular concern uh, in terms of confidence in local policing. You've, uh, through Jerry's questioning, you've, uh, you've answered uh, partly in terms of what can be done going forward to maybe reduce the risk of such uh, things reoccurring. But I did want to ask you specifically whether steps can be taken or are being taken to a certain if such, a certain if such whatsapp group exchanges are currently systemic within psni um well i think firstly uh, it's about our own powers or the ombudsman's powers we can't just do without cause dip sampling of what's on somebody's phone uh, which is the most likely route to to um do that because it will raise a whole number of other um, privacy issues. Now, you might find that a bit bizarre as an employer, but just like anyone else, we have to operate w within the frameworks that are before us. Obviously, the coal rain matter is still a live matter, so we don't really want to get too drawn into that. But I think, as I said in an answer to an earlier question, w the, the most imme immediate remedy to the WhatsApp issue, because we, we would probably resume that we said many times for usually better reasons that we are reflective of the society which we police that this isn't a phenomenon that's just unique to policing. People do use that sort of closed group to express all sorts of different views and different ways in all sorts of professions. It's not just us, and that's not to sort of diminish the effects on competence in policing that it does. But the use of the origin software that we're, we're intending to roll out in the next few months and the messaging service within that at least gives us the space and permission to then prohibit use within the workplace. And then that's a further deterrent to people deciding that it's only okay to use a police system to put it across views, messages, images that none of us would find are acceptable. But I don't know if you want to say anything else, Mark. Yes, so um, most of the well, WhatsApp's being used obviously on people's private phones, um, not on the police system. Um, and lots of, you know, lots of organizations use WhatsApp to communicate with each other, you know, very legitimately, we, we accept that. Um, uh, the High Court in Scotland, supported by the Court in London have have upheld the ruling that the right to privacy rights of police officers is less than that which would be expected by a non-public servant. 
Um, so that, that has been established. Um, therefore, you know, that's why there's quite a lot of our investigations that start out. And I'm talking generically here, if I may, if away, if I may Michael, a lot of our investigations start out as part of, as part of investigation, particularly a criminal one, we will seize phones. Uh, and then when we're examining phones and so forth, then if we see other behaviour that is breach of our code of conduct, we, we would pursue that. Um, there are other judicial reviews running in this jurisdiction based upon stuff that we have got at the moment. We'll be very careful. Um, but our organisation does it does know, and we had this. I had this discussion with the Federation just before, before last Christmas as well to explain to them that the police officers need to understand that in, in the role of the public office that they hold, that, that their rights uh, in some areas can be more limited, um, and that the expectations of the public are higher. So there is no placing purpose for these for the types of things that these allegations are leading to. Um, there is no justification for them. Um, as the Chief said, we, will, we intend to try and introduce on our own system a messaging service that allows legitimate messages to be passed that would obviate the need in any, any shape or form for WhatsApp groups. But then, obviously, also, Michael, some of this stuff is not also on duty conduct. It's off duty conduct, you know, as well. And it's very, it's almost impossible for us to regulate or police what officers are doing when they're not, not on duty. And what they're talking about as well and and that is a question with respect for people's own sense of standards and morality and um, however we will hold them to the account to account against the code of ethics um, and um, and then take action as an employer so just one final question i mean is it the case that I mean, the police aren't don't issue standard phones for um Police use that you know the issue is more likely to be a private phone issue. Is that is that correct? The um, the phones that we issue, the mobile devices that we issue, are you can only put material stuff onto that that's that's authorized by IC, by us. And um, there is a public side to those phones as well that can be used. But again, we can monitor everything. So in this this is this is um, to my best of my knowledge um, entirely people's. Person, person, personal stuff. Okay, thank you for that. We're going to move into some uh, wider areas of questions in the time that's left here. So I'm going to start with uh, Mike. Thank you. I've, I've recently become aware, Simon, of an issue that appears to have a significant impact on service delivery. And it's with regard to officers who are not cleared or trained to drive police vehicles uh, and specifically to drive them with sirens and uh, blue lights uh, in pursuit mode. Uh, my question is this, it appears to have been going on since before COVID, so a number of years, and yet I have yet to met, meet a single member of this board or a member of the staff of the board who has been made aware of the problem by the police service of Northern Ireland. Is that appropriate not to brief the board when you've got an issue of this magnitude? Um. Well, in one sense, I think we try to define ourselves by being as open as we can. And I suppose there's a, there's a judgment of choice about what we bring forward. It, I imagine, that, and again, I stand to be corrected, but it is that the issues you raise is, is on the risk register, which I think uh, certainly officials will get to see. Um, it, it is an issue we're trying to deal with. Uh, partly it's caused by, initially, it was um, lack of driving instructors pre-COVID. Then COVID reduced the number of people we could put in a vehicle. And until recently, as you know, we were recruiting quite heavily and actively. So we've tried to put a number of mitigations in. So, for example, I think what you're referring to there, Mike, is effectively A to B driving, where with a minimum of check, we'll let people drive a police vehicle to sort of attend a call, take a statement in an anonymous situation. And we have put additional resource now into training to clear, clear backlogs. But I'll, I'll just... Um, bring Pamela in if, if you like to give an update of the here and now, but I think it's maybe something outside of here to sort of see how we get the issues right, because uh, the risk register is the main vehicle which we would use to highlight the key issues corporately that we'd be concerned about. And I, I again, I stand to be corrected, but I, I did think that came here. Yeah. 
Yeah, Mike, thanks for the question. And you're highlighting an issue which would be chief among the concerns of frontline response officers. It's a major frustration for them. The chief's outlined the kind of history of how we arrived in this situation. Uh, it's as a result of some previous cutbacks, actually, that we had to make in response to a previous period of austerity. It's very much a live issue for us. I'm committed to working with our head of people in OD in order to try and address the backlog that we have around this. You'll be aware of the situation with police recruitment, if there is a even a potential silver lining to that, it's that we have fewer student officers coming through and we are developing a plan in order to address that backlog and get as many response drivers back out in the sections as we possibly can. And just one follow-up, Bobby, if I may. Does, is the, or one of the consequences of that that some response drivers are, are driving more hours and more miles than you would wish? Yeah, that's absolutely right, and it's something that we are concerned about in terms of officer welfare and well-being. Certainly in our more rural areas, we're seeing officers having to drive significant distances. Uh, obviously still in full protective body armour as well, which adds additional pressures and stress to them. So it's a situation that we're, we're not happy with and that we want to address as soon as possible for the, the welfare and well-being of the workforce. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, going to move on to uh, John, who had questioned around uh, uh, around the threat level. John, Chair, sure, thank you. Uh, the question is really a, a follow-on from the high-profile activities uh, of loyalist paramilitaries, the arrests and, and conviction in relation to these. Is the PSNI involved in or aware of any reassessment of the threat posed by by these loyalists? Uh, paramilitaries either to national security or to communities and the safety of people in those communities because it seems to me that these reports, the arrests and indeed the, the outcomes that have been secured highlight some very threatening and destructive behaviour. Sorry, thanks John. I think there's two, two layers to this. One is the work that we do to tackle serious organised crime. Uh, I think we've briefed previously around and I think it's actually referenced in the annual report about the number of organised crime groups that, that we try to frustrate, disrupt and dismantle. Uh, so that would bring into purview, obviously, the paramilitary groups that you, you are referring to. And as I said earlier, that you'll see um, some of the activity, and it's not exclusively the paramilitary crime task force, but the bulk of it, um, would show an increase in activity and effect over the last couple of years. So that's, that's a tribute to a whole host of people. Um, we want to do more to try and continue to address this sort of behaviour, which does undermine the fabric of some communities. And we are working closely with the Department of Justice to see how we bring in different ideas and different tactics to keep us on the front foot in that endeavour. But clearly, we also work with other partners in the crime fighting space, uh, notably the National Crime Agency, um, the um, Customs and Revenue Service, to name but two. And there are plans in the medium term to try and bring those together as part of our state strategy and what we're seeing as a crime campus. I know there's specific concern given recent events, which we won't go into too much detail again for legal reasons, um, but Mark can probably explain how we have a relationship with the security service, who's our main partner in making those assessments. Yeah, John, so, I mean, the issue of, of the loyalist activities, is, is the investigations are all led by the police service. Um, um, whilst the recent attacks were um, treated as national security incidents, uh, they're not um, part of the national security assessment by MI5 in terms of the overall threat level. Um, but all the apparatus has been brought to bear just to, to deal with um, the, the matters that, 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 that arose. Um, I think it's fair to say that we haven't seen other than the, some of the instances you've talked about, haven't seen a specific upturn uh, or intelligence of an upturn uh, in, in notice paramilitary activity. Um, that's not just to diminish the seriousness of the, of the incidents that, that, that have occurred. Um, but we're not seeing any particular increase uh, of, as you, as you described, the threat to the national security of Northern Ireland at the minute uh, uh, from them. And more directly in terms of the, the assessment, there's no reassessment taking place currently. Is there likely to be one in the future? Well, the national security threat now is 
due for reassessment in the next couple of months. Um, and that sets the threat assessment for Northern Ireland, which we discussed at an earlier board, help with it having been reassessed, I think, in March. So it's due to be reassessed. It is assessed every six months, John. Thank you. Um, I've got questions that were drawn toward the end, but I've got questions still from Frank and from Trevor. Is there anyone else? Because I know other people had questions that they've drawn back. Anyone else who desperately wishes to get in with a question before we finish on those two? No. OK. So, um, Frank, your question on uh, tackling drugs. Thank you very much, John. Simon, in your report, uh, your annual report, and in your monthly report, um, it's encouraging to hear about the success you're having relating to the prevention of the supply and the dealing of drugs. But I suspect it's only the tip of the iceberg. Um, can you share with the board what are the big things that you need as a force and where applicable can you quantify them? Um, be it resource, ring fence, budgets, um, public information, support from other forces, the list is endless. These things which you believe, if you are able to implement them, um, can make a significant impact in, and I know it's a wish, the eradication of drugs in our society. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Well, I think the first thing is to start by um, just echoing what you said about the role of the public. Um, and my appeal would be that if people have suspicions about people who they will see in their communities that they think are peddling drugs that are causing harm, to either highlight that directly to a police officer or to use the Crime Stoppers hotline. Because as you say, there has been increasing success over the last 12, 18 months, again, which are referred to in the annual report of taking significant amounts of drugs off our streets, which is a good thing, but no one would pretend that um, we are eradicating the problem from society. Um, I think the whole matter of drug policy is a, a wider issue of concern. I mean, we touch occasionally on the sort of the scourge of drug related deaths in this country which is a whole wider social policy issue, I think, that is reflected on misuse and supply of uh, illegal prescription drugs, often but not exclusively. So I think that's probably a whole bigger question for another day. Um, in relation to the specifics of resources, clearly uh, in the trajectory that we are currently on, uh, we are losing headcount of police officers. And obviously any sort of drugs investigation may involve a blend of people. It could be someone taking a car off the road from the intercept team. It could be a neighbor officer that's executing a search warrant because of localized information or indeed specialized teams, such as the Power Military Crime Task Force that um, will, will develop more longer term investigations in cases before bringing people to book, um, searching homes and, and then bringing prosecution. So I think actually it's a, a point, Frank, where we would have to sort of highlight as the workforce shrinks it will bring into bear very difficult choices about what we prioritise between things like ensuring public protection, protecting violence against women and girls and the issues that fall out of that, which is very much a topical issue, as maintaining the resilience to continue to frustrate and di to disrupt the activities of those groups that want to peddle drugs in our streets. I think in the medium term, I'd also be keen, and I've said it before, on the notion of our, our version of like the Gart Kosh Crime Centre, which is the Scottish model where you have a number of agencies under one roof so we can sort of speed up and improve information sharing. And we've had some really good examples, both for the fusion operation that's referred to in the report or general investigation with other partners. But I think getting us all in one place uh, will improve things. Uh, looking at how we seize assets is another end of the journey. So something like the Criminal Assets Bureau, I think is again something that we've sort of drifted in and out of. So there are things that we could probably give a more detailed and specific response than just a few sort of sentences and headlines today. But I think it's to reinforce that we won't demur from our responsibilities to see drugs as a priority. And we're doing work at the moment. Probably will bring back to you in the September meeting what we say is plan on a page about our, our operational priorities and clearly to, to continue to address organised crime and drugs harm will remain one of them. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Trevor. Thank you. Um, so, social media and the use of, I mean, I know we've addressed this previously in terms of your officers. I think they've started to get better at it again. Will it be local engagement with the officer out in the beat? Will it be your, uh, your traffic police out in terms of showing 
some of the Texans. I said they've been very successful this last, last number of days. But there's one that's popping up which has not been led by the police but by the community, where the police are now, and it's, I would really remind you of an overzealous police officer who's more interested in the environment than he has in road safety, where people are being prohibited from cutting their roadside hedges. Now, from a rural dwelling point of view, roadside hedges and cutting back is a very important issue. Mm. But there is one district close to actually one I live in, where it's made in the social media indeed, it's actually Landis constituency in Mid-Ulster, where there's an overzealous attempt to prevent people from cutting roadside hedges. Mm. Now, I know you could argue that, that it is a criminal offence, indeed it's a cross-compliance issue, but is there, is there no, no common sense in terms of the approach that some of the officers are taking to, in relation to that? And if there is, can there be an instruction passed on in relation to common sense? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, it's not something I, I was aware of or, or noticed. It's probably just best to see at the, the end to see if himself or Bobby can understand a bit of detail. So um, I, I'm not fully familiar with the law on hedges, to be honest with you, so I'll have to phone a friend. But I, I imagine there's something about visibility and safety as opposed to, um, you know, protecting the environment. So and presuming nesting birds and that sort of thing. So it'll be maybe a time of year, but without rushing to the wrong answer, if we have a chat at the end, we'll see if we get to the bottom of it. Okay, we'll get that fed back in again. Um, thank you very much, um, Chief Constable and all of your senior team who've come in today to take our questions. We trust that the period ahead will be uh, peaceful uh, and thank you in advance to all those in the community who will work with the police on issues in the period ahead uh, to maintain uh, what we have, which is a peaceful period just now. Uh, our next meeting in public will be on the 1st of September. We hope actually that come the autumn we will be able to go back to the way meetings in public were, which were that the public are actually allowed to come in to our meeting room where they wish uh, and experience the meeting. But further information on that will come out depending on health development issues through, uh, through the summer period. But hopefully it will be an opportunity for public to join our meetings again. Uh, thank you to those who joined us online. That opportunity will continue anyway, whatever happens about the uh, public coming in next month. And I wish you all uh, a peaceful summer. Thank you.